it's lovely to be here. Um, in fact, it's a huge honour because obviously as someone who's been involved with children's rights advocacy for a long time, I'm very familiar with the work of the Children's Rights Alliance and an awful lot of the organisations that were here. So it's fantastic seeing familiar faces and also to see, the new, to see people whose names I've heard before but I've never actually met in the flesh. And of course, it's nice to be home, albeit that the weather has decided to let us down today. But so what I want to do is, first of all, I'd echo 100% what, my, you know, what Michael has said. And I think it's, very, it's great that Michael spoke first, because in fact, what I'm talking, going to talk about now is very much focusing on how one might specifically use the CRC as a tool for advocacy in a particular context, and very much in the, con in the Irish context at the moment with regard to children's rights. And the fact is that you will know far better than I will that we are at an absolutely crucial juncture, both in Ireland and in fact internationally, with regards to children's rights. The economic, uh, the financial and the subsequent economic crisis and the responses to those crises have already had a hugely negative impact on children's rights, both here and abroad, and it looks set to do so. And my aim today is really to start a conversation, hopefully with, you know, and hopefully there'll be quite a bit of feedback from yourselves during question time, is to start a conversation about how the CRC can serve as a tool in challenging the specific problems with regards to children's rights that we're seeing emerging post-2008. Now, in order to do so, I'm going to focus on four key points. First of all, we're going to have a bit of a quick, I'll have a quick, quickly run through the position of children after the global financial and economic crises, right? Because I think it's important to set the scene for what, what I'm going to argue to you today. I'm also going to argue, echoing a lot of what Michael has said, argue what, or explain why we should be looking to the CRC. Why are we looking at this international human rights instrument rather than, say, EU law, the human rights, the uh, uh, European Convention of Human Rights, a whole range, you know, the different frameworks that are available for us. I then want, just because, and again, like Michael has said earlier, many of you will be very familiar with this, but just so that we're all on the same page, I want to very quickly go through some of the key provisions of the Convention that are relevant to children in the post-crisis context, right? Where should we be looking if we're thinking of using the CRC? Because it's a long enough instrument and obviously I won't cover it all today, so I'm just going to highlight key issues. And finally, again echoing Michael, um, who I am really glad went first, I want to finish by talking about where we as children's rights advocates, whether you know, working for you know, statutory bodies, NGOs, policymakers, where should we be going from here, given our concern with children's rights? Now, you can see from this, this is the kind of, of, of slide that makes me popular amongst all my <laughs> students. Right? Note the fact that you're never meant to have more than five lines. I think there might be 14 on that slide, right? So I apologise. But essentially, I, I was just to prove that I wasn't going to talk for too long. So what, I, what, are, what are we seeing in terms of the position of children after the global financial and economic crises, right? Well, what we're seeing is all the problems that were there already are entrenched and they are getting worse. Right? And this is a particular, there is growing evidence specifically with regard to child poverty that we're seeing an entrenchment and an exacerbation of child poverty and inequality. Right? And systemic disadvantage that we know leads to child poverty and other factors that, that affect child poverty. So it has been, the crises have been incredibly bad news from that perspective. Nationally, we're seeing projections of significant increases in child poverty and deprivation. For instance, we can see the, the results of the um, EU-related survey on income and living conditions that show significant increases between 2009 and 2010 in terms of child deprivation. And the reason they only go that far is because that's how far the data brings them, right? We won't be look, I would be surprised if we were looking at a dramatic improvement post-2010, but I'd be delighted to be contradicted. Um, we're also seeing the very negative impact of the post-crisis budgets cuts on children, right? And we see the fantastic work that groups like Social Justice have done around this and the Children's Rights um, Alliance budget analyses, which are absolutely vital in taking, you know, the impact of the crisis and mapping it on to children, you know, connecting it to the position of children and children's rights. At the international level, we're seeing a huge slowdown and in some cases backward steps in the achievement of Millennium Development Goals like child survival, nutrition, education. We're seeing this stunning statistic from the World Bank 
that we're likely to see 55,000 children, more children dying annually as a direct result of the crisis, right? Leading to 265,000 extra deaths between 2009 and 2015. And finally, we see a lot of work has been done, and if any of you are interested in the context, in the issue of the economic crisis and human rights, look at the work of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Magdalena Sepulveda. She's, her work is extremely good, terribly clear, accessible, and she has, she has highlighted in her work consistently that the crisis has had a clearly disproportionate and devastating effect on children. So that it's not that children are being hit as hard as everyone else, it's, being the, it's that they're being hit harder. The reason I'm highlighting the international is not because I think the position of children in Ireland is, pro is you know, accurately comparable to Mali. What I want to highlight, though, is the challenges that we're seeing in Ireland are being reflected to a greater or lesser degree internationally, and we can look outside to other places for lessons that we can use when we're designing our advocacy. Why should we be looking at the CRC? Well, first of all, as Michael highlighted in his presentation, it imposes legally binding international child rights obligations in Ireland. If you didn't have the CRC, we wouldn't have this. Okay? It's an absolutely crucial instrument. As Michael has also spoken about, the reporting mechanism under the CRC is a key way to hold the state to account. And for instance, if we look at the UK, if we look at previous you know, ac activity here with regards to the other UN treaties, it is a great focus for unified <coughs> advocacy and in terms of media campaigns, etc. The CRC also contains a wide range of rights relevant to the impact of the crisis on children, including economic and social and cultural rights and participation rights. So we're looking at things like housing, health, adequate standard of living. And this links with my next point, because you know what? You look at the Irish Constitution, you look at Irish statute law, you don't see a right to housing, you don't see a right to health, you don't see a right to food, you don't see a right to an adequate standard of living. Okay? So if we didn't have this, where would we be? And finally, I just, and I, I'm not going to get into this but the, in any detail, is that the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the monitoring body that Michael uh, discussed earlier, their statements can provide guidance and advocacy tools to Irish child rights advocates that we wouldn't be able to get from elsewhere. Now, at the moment, because of the reporting process, and that is why the Irish report is so important, and the shadow report is so important, the reporting process has, because of this two-year gap, has not caught up with the economic crisis, if you know what I mean. The reports that the committee deals with now were written two years ago, so the statistics are out of date, they're not dealing with the full impact. So this will be a real opportunity for the Children's Rights Alliance and others of you working on it to bring up-to-date data saying this is what the crisis has meant in Ireland with regards to children's rights. What do we see under the CRC? We see, you know, I've already said, we see survival and development of the child, the rights of disabled children to, spe to special care, health rights, social security, adequate standard of living, education, rest, rest to to, to right to rest and leisure and play. And you know what? If we look at this and we look at the headlines, if you follow the Children's Rights Alliance Twitter account, it is, you know, that alone will make, you know, make it extremely clear that all of these rights have been affected by the crises and the Irish state's response to them, right? These are the key areas that have been impacted upon. So, this is why I have my PowerPoint. I have it because this is, if you are doing advocacy around this issue, you have to engage, and this is not going to be a boring lecture, don't worry, you have to be prepared to engage with the issue, with the actual wording of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and with not what we would like it to say, sorry, as I move away from the microphone, not what we would like it to say, not what it may necessarily be most useful for it to say, but actually what it does say. Because if we're going to make effective arguments to the committee, to government, to other UN bodies, we have to clearly understand what it is the convention says and what it requires of states, right? And I say this because often we, you can see analyses of international human rights law that aren't necessarily accurate. So it's very important that we'd avoid that mistake. So what do we see? Now, Michael will certainly agree, and those of you who've ever done international human rights law will note the delicate, carefully crafted, completely incomprehensible, turgid language that makes up much of, uh, much of international human rights law, and Article 4 is no exception. So what does it say? It says states parties shall undertake all appropriate legislative, administrative, budgetary, implicit, other measures to give effect to the rights recognised in the Convention. And with regard to economic, social and cultural rights, so food, health, housing, 
States shall undertake such measures to the maximum extent of their available resources and where needed within the framework of international cooperation. Right. We want to, I want you to take, you can think about that language. In fact, what you've come, what the committee has done is that they have turned around and they have said, well, actually, we have views on what children's economic, social and cultural rights impose in terms of duties. And what we're going to do is take guidance from another UN body, the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, that monitors another instrument called the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And as a result, what they've done is they've essentially whole scale adopted the language that, that the other committee has used. Um, and they've applied that to Article 4. And what they've essentially said is that economic, social and cultural rights under the convention impose a duty of what is called progressive realisation, right? So a duty to move forward consistently and effectively and as fast as possible to the re full realisation of rights. But that this duty is qualified by the maximum available resources available to the state. So it's an acknowledgement that, you know, if the state doesn't have the money to fully realise rights, then that's just the way it is. But the fact that the state can't realise all aspects of all rights at once doesn't mean it can sit back and do nothing. And of course, and it, means it, it doesn't necessarily mean it can take steps backwards. And that, of course, is hugely important in the current Irish context, where we are really terribly concerned about the steps backwards in children's rights. So what does it mean? You know, if you were going in and you were saying, actually, I am going to go in and I'm going to use the CRC as an advocacy tool, what would you say it meant? What would you say with Article 4, right? First of all, note that when it talks about using maximum available resources, it is talking about real resources. That is, the resources available to government beyond current. It doesn't necessarily mean you go with the government says, oh, we have so much to spend on health. It may mean moving beyond that and seeing what other distributions are being made in the budget and challenging how little is being given to health. It may, in fact, mean challenging, and there's more and more work being done on this, macroeconomic decision making that says, well, we're not going to raise, for instance, in the UK, where they, were, they haven't raised taxes, but they're making cuts to programs and say, well, actually, you know, your maximum available resources, and you can imagine how controversial this is, you're not taxing people, so you're not, in fact, getting in as many resources as you could to satisfy rights. So it's really a case, I'm not saying that that's the advocacy to go to, but you should, let the, you should go to. But we need to be aware that when the government says this is all we have for health, it is perfectly legitimate to challenge that in terms of the CRC. Spending has to be sufficient, it has to be adequate to satisfy rights, it has to be efficient, right? Very importantly, the state, states have to channel funding in terms of ESCR related need, right? Mm -hmm. So in Ireland, this would require, for instance, prioritization of traveler children, children with disabilities, migrant children. Let's think very hard about the cut to special resource teachers over the last few years as an example of how that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Funding allocated to economic, social, and cultural rights has to be used for that purpose, right? And in 2009, 2010, I don't know whether it's the same in 2000, was the same in 2011, you had a situation in which two months before the budget year was up, it became clear that, this, that uh, the Department of Education had only spent 50% of its budget on capital infrastructure allocated to building new schools and classrooms. And they could only hold on to 10% of that money in the following year. So essentially, 40% of the money allocated for that was going, going to go back to the Department of Finance. So it was being moved, instead of being spent on the child's right to education, it was going elsewhere. And that isn't acceptable in terms of the CRC. You have to have smooth administration and management of allocated resources, right? That means you have to train people to deal with resources effectively, whether at the national and, very importantly, at the local authority level, where there's you know, a huge amount of important decision making. And when we're talking about maximum available resources, I want us to think about something that was in the news yesterday, where Minister uh, Joan Bruton proposed that we might have taxation on child benefit for high earners. Now, on the one hand, you might say, fantastic, it's a way of increasing resources available for satisfying children's economic, social, and cultural rights. But you know what? It's only a way of increasing resources if the money from the tax goes towards those rights. So we have to think very hard about, you know, when, is that a step forward? Well, where is the money going to go? We need to, that needs to be made clear, um, made clear by the government. Progressive realisation. Um, it refers to actual progress and actual enjoyment of rights. It's very easy, particularly where there's political uh, 
political uh, you know, attention to a topic, for government to say we're going to throw, to throw money at a problem, right? And in fact, it, you know, they throw money at the problem, but it doesn't in fact improve rights enjoyment. It's just, you know, it, they get to have a big hoo-ha about it, but the problem continues. The state, as I said, has to move as effectively and as quickly as possible. Uh, don't worry, I'm coming to an end. It, needs, it means expanding economic, social, and cultural rights access to a larger number of people and increasing the range of people. Okay, so that means if you increase enjoy, you know, if more people are enjoying the right to education, that's great. But if you have travellers, if you have people who are, you know, have non-English mother tongue parents being excluded, you're not satisfying Article 4. And you have to have program funding and programmatic priority. And I really would welcome people to think about how these requirements match up with the post-crisis situation of children in Ireland, right? They're fairly easy tests to satisfy. We have enough clearing examples. How would you use the standards? The final thing I want to talk about in terms of obligations um, is this issue of a prohibition on deliberate retrogressive measures, right? An example of how, you know, they could have just said backward steps. That would have meant the same thing. So forget retrogressive measures, it means backward steps, right? And the thing is, if you have an economic crisis, if you have a conflict, for instance, if you have a natural disaster, it is understood there will be times where the states, you know, have to take steps backwards in terms of rights enjoyment. But there's very, there are limitations as to when and where and how you can make those cuts. And for instance, if we look at the CRC, cuts to children's rights services, for instance, related services, require the most careful consideration and need to be fully justified by reference to the totality of CRC rights and the context of the full use of maximum available resources. So I want us to think, does Section 4 of the Social Welfare and Pensions Act 2012 satisfy that? Do the cuts to child benefits satisfy that? Do child rights related service cuts satisfy that? We need, you know, these are tests, we need to think about how the tests apply. This is something, this final point that I'll talk about in the context of obligations. This is something that I would probably not have considered a priority if I was giving this talk two years ago in Ireland. And that is the obligation of states to satisfy the minimum core obligation, right? So the minimum essential content related to survival imposed by economic, social, and cultural rights. So primary health care, prim uh, you know, basic education, basic shelter, you know, the absolute minimum to ensure kind of personal autonomy. But you know what? We saw in the newspaper last week that child collapsing out of hunger in Cork. We're seeing schools clamouring to be part of the free meal system. This is actually an obligation that if you're doing a report, we may well need to look at, especially with increasing child homelessness. Okay? So I'm just saying... Whereas I would have discounted it before, by goodness, you know, the world is opening up thanks to the economic crisis. I'm going to finish now, and I can see Paul practically weeping with relief, <laughs> um, by talking about where should we go from here. You know what? First of all, we need to start asking the children's rights question when dealing with issues around social and economic policy, right? We're, you know, people working on children's rights and children-related issues need to take ownership of discussions around social and economic policies. And we need to make clear arguments as to the role that children's rights should play in the formulation and implementation of policy, right? It's not a case of us simply commenting on policy made. We need to try to intervene to change the discourse. And that is happening more effectively in some, in other countries than it is here. Maybe the shadow report, periodic report is a golden opportunity. Another thing we'll see is that at the moment, whenever there's an issue around a cut, we see here the state response that uh, well, you know, it's the EU IMF bailout, wash our hands, there's nothing we can do, right? It is very important when making arguments around the CRC that we look at what the state can and can't do in terms of the EU and IMF bailout. And in fact, while the state is constrained, we are absolutely, in terms of the CRC, entitled to require them to, pr to put, in, put in place arrangements that are as child-friendly and child-centred as possible. Has the state done everything it can do to give effect to children's rights? We need to, and I, I say this now because it's an area that I've been doing work on, but it's happening all over the place. If we want to make arguments with regards to economics, we need to work with economists to, some, to the greatest degree possible, purely because of the, you know, 
fantastic if you have the capacity in your organizations. There are very few human rights organizations that do. I'm not saying it's always an easy cooperation, but the conversation always works. But government takes economics arguments seriously and regards children's rights, as we all know, as kind of a fuzzy wuzzy extra to be lashed on at the end, if at all, right? So if we want to be, you know, one of the, um, excuse the sexist statement, one of the big boys, then we have to be able to use the arguments the government responds to. The other thing, with regard to the law, we need to be aware of the laws entrenching austerity and child ch ch poverty, right? So the Social Welfare and Pensions Act 2012, and we need to challenge it. I was really struck, and I'm sure people will put up their hand now and just say that I'm speaking outrageously, by the difference in the level of advocacy around the Social Welfare Act 2012 and the UK Welfare Act 2012. For instance, you had the fantastic Seven is Too Young campaign, but in terms of the broader long-term advocacy, but certainly the media wasn't picking up on it. And that's the kind of thing where if there's going to be a legislative measure, and so much social security is affected by legislation, or a lower level law, we need to be involved. There will be legal challenges. There's already the case to the uh, autism allowance, the domiciliary home care allowance being taken by Mrs. Flood. Look at the cases from elsewhere. Litigation isn't going to get, my, is not my argument that's going to get you very far, but there are examples. My final thing that I want to talk about is at the moment you cannot turn the corner, well, you literally can't turn the corner here, without seeing a poster about the EU Fiscal Compact uh, Treaty. And you know, it's all very well, and we can see that we've been promised a children's rights constitutional referendum. But when we're talking and we're advoc there's advocacy around the wording of that provision, we need to be very conscious that as it stands, that draft wording doesn't give effect to economic and social rights. I mean, to think about how is that wording going to balance against this, the introduction of this particular mechanism that could have very serious implications for children, children's enjoyment of their rights. And we need to bear that in mind with our advocacy around, say, the treaty, but also around uh, the Constitution Amendment itself. Okay, sorry for going over time. Thank you.